At the start of the 20th century, the Great Wild World apparently didn't seem to be turning out badly. Pierre Goujon, an MP, was addressing the French Parliament, admiring a respected pacifist comrade, Jean Jaurès. Robert Besnard, an artist and painter, could have figured out the field stretching between Toul and Pont-à-Mousson in the regional department of Nantes et Moselle. The musician, Alberic Magnar, could have felt inspired by the magnificent wind of history which sent notes dancing in the tall trees of the forest surrounding Thiokor. Charles Peggy would have been filled with the silence as deep as the long sheaves of corn harvested on the vast plain in Bernicourt. He would have found it shared as close as a sharing can be. In the forest of Lorraine, Alain Fournier would have felt a nostalgia similar to that which he softly instilled in the pages of his novel, Le Grand Monde. We are somewhere in the northeast of France, near the Belgian and German borders, an isolated region, deeply rooted in rurality, but utterly neglected by the great upheavals of the newborn century. The harvest has just been garnered. The leaves are trembling in the breeze. The forests ripple in the wind in this late summer of 1914. But the war broke out, fell down over the world as suddenly as night falls. Pierre, Robert, Charles and Alan will die, the five of them before fall. Just like so many others with them, themselves toward this bastion territory, on which, from 1914 to 1918, so many nations got crushed against another nation here in that desolate piece of land. A century has passed. A kind of world viewed in black and white has disappeared, but we are still haunted by its spirit. The world has gained new colors. It had to. Three of them might have lived, for sure. What awaits them is but a liner. A poet will sing later on. And another poet will add, walking here, free of worries, on the superb turf, suddenly an ear-splitting noise, under the grass now thou lying. Located on the western edge of Tiokor, the west we know of here, someone influenced by the far west beyond the Atlantic Ocean, such a distant west, the American cemetery has now become a shelter for the graves of more than 4,153 men and women who had only arrived in 1917, but had nearly all died in the terrible Meuse offensive, a few months only before the armistice was signed. They too had reached a borderline, the trenches, and had had to stop because of a ridiculous ridge right in the middle of summer in the south of Verdun. One of them was a farmer in Gallup, New Mexico. Another one used to contemplate the waves of the Pacific dancing in the northern bay of San Francisco. And that one here lived somewhere in New York, where the tall buildings at starting scraping the sky, a symbol of man's arrogance, excessiveness and folly to come. And then there was also this passionate horse rider roaming the vast plains of North Dakota, where the winds are said to blow over the border. The eagle, set here, watches over those men's eternal rest. It supports a sundial on which General Perching's words have been engraved. 
Time will never erase their glorious deeds. No, tragedies never fade with time. Never, ever. If on one side of this little town close to the Meuse department, this field of the dead is an American property. Just a gunshot away, scarcely a kilometer away, there is another cemetery, rather unnoticed. How incongruous history is. That other one, as a final blow, has only been rented, as if a vanquished nation had no other choice but to show a low profile. That cemetery is German. Sometimes French kids, in an attempt to kill time, are bold enough to come to those places laden with history. It is a time for other discussions, sweeter and more joyful, a time for schoolboys' meetings. Underneath the place where those young people stand in jeans and in today's brightly colored clothes, some other men are buried in their dark green uniforms. Do these youngsters know that some people from Moselle, who also used to be from the Lorraine region, are lying there under the ground? Since the end of the Great War, they have been lying here side by side with the ones whose nationality they had to share in 1871 for reasons they could not understand. We are now in a necropolis, situated right in between two villages, running from one century into the next. It was offering an astounding symbol in November 2012. Here, the time passing by seems to be suspended, or rather accelerated, in a strange white flight. It is just as if the dead had decided to remain silent, and while building companies are kept busy, the crosses act out a strange egalitarian type of communion. War suspends its blight flight. All the different names blend into one and shape a straight line in which middle-class people and peasants, soldiers and teachers, artists and craftsmen line up as one man. Then finally there is Duomo, the first national necropolis. If 18 million died there, another 18 million victims remained alive, but at what cost? These are ghosts too, restless ghosts, their lives having been shattered forever. Beyond the scars of war, today's young men drill into concrete bars built a century ago for new white crosses to be planted in. In their turn, these crosses will face eternity, standing there both proudly and humbly, modest yelling witnesses whose silent scream is an eternal reminder of the horrors of war. Those who today work and flourish the place are the same age as the ones who a century ago dug the trenches, honored their dead pals, crashed down under the bullets and the burdens of days. Have we really disturbed today these men of yesterday, cut down by the hails of bullets, having fallen in the mud at the bottom of the trenches? However, during the first months of 1914, burying the dead was not a priority. Those who fell were buried on the place and sometimes right in the middle of a field. Memorial pilgrimages or remembrance tourism, so-called today, is developing on our northeastern territories as the dates of commemoration get closer. The necropolis in Fleury, created on ground cleared in 1919, reassembles nearly 3,000 soldiers lying under those white crosses gathered in the surrounding villages. Families are visiting the cemeteries as if they wanted to become impregnated by the fights that long ago had torn apart the peoples of Europe. Much later, the front stretched further. The heavier the death toll filling up the cemeteries, the stronger the hatred striking the belligerents like the plague or the Spanish flu. We come here following our grandparents and parents alike in a kind of pilgrimage, not to forget that in 1914, our beloved one left from the south of France 
and never came back. Our children will probably do the same. Thus sleep well, O Earth. Beneath your great black sheet, all your wars forget and your sadness reject. Reste-t-il sous la terre Après toutes ces années Un paysan, un militaire Hure la même destinée Des fantômes de la grande guerre Ont traversé tout ce temps Leur poussière et la poussière Seront les jouets du vent Que reste-t-il sous la pierre Du nouveau siècle étouffé Des enfants qui récupèrent Une fille sous la rosée Des fantômes de la grande guerre Ont traversé tout ce temps Leur poussière et la poussière Les jouets du vent Que reste-t-il en mémoire Un tourisme souvenir Une nation, un territoire Une Europe en Du vent. Du vent.